Good evening and welcome to El Oso Pumar Takes. This is our 87th take live from Euless, Texas. I'm Bear Duplicity, your host as always, and I'm so proud, so privileged, and so pleased to welcome you all in tonight. And I am so excited about this show uh, for a lot of reasons, and I will get to my guest in just a moment. But as always, we've got to pay homage to the people that make this show possible, and that, of course, is our sponsors. Tonight's show is sponsored by, of course, by Drew Estate. Drew Estate announced earlier this week that the limited edition Undercrown Shade Suprema is shipping to Drew Diplomat retailers nationwide. The Suprema was showcased at this past year's IPCPR now, PCA trade show held in Las Vegas last month. The limited edition Undercrown Shade Suprema is a perfecto wrapped in a creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut shade leaf with rich Sumatran binder and filler leaves from the Dominican Criollo 98, Nicaraguan Crojo, and Nicaraguan Criollo as well. The limited Vitola presents a bolder profile on the palette and compared to core sizes while remaining a smooth and smoking experience. Jonathan Drew, president and founder of Drew Estate, as the Undercrown brand message is an unwavering tribute to the Buncheros and Roleros who work the factory floor at Drew Estate. We owe them so much and deeply respect their talent and commitment. We are incredibly proud to get, dedicate the Undercrown Shade Suprema to them. So check out Drew Estate um, Supremo, which is now shipped nationwide. And of course, if you are watching this show on Facebook Live, we really appreciate you. Uh, and appreciate you for tuning in live and catching us on YouTube perhaps later on. But if you are listening wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Podbean, tune in or wherever you listen to podcasts you're listening to us exclusively because of cornelius and anthony premium cigars cornelius and anthony premium cigars is a brand steeped into tobacco tradition for over 150 years the bailey family has been a part of america's tobacco heritage passionately caring for the land they cultivate in keysville virginia cornelius and anthony's devotion to the finest grown tobacco and foremost aspects of craftsmanship allows them to introduce the most exquisite cigars to the market they invite you to enjoy their portfolio of premium hand-rolled cigars and experience their dedication to producing an exceptional product so again thank you so much for tuning in tonight i am so freaking ecstatic about this show um and i just said freaking i don't even know why but it doesn't matter uh it is my honor to welcome in um mr vintage himself the owner and man behind 724 cigars kurt kendall to ls fumar takes kurt how are you doing tonight good i'm doing good bear how are you Oh, I'm doing fantastic. I am doing fantastic. This, um, this is a real big honor for me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm honored and privileged to talk to a lot of people like yourself in the industry. Um, but there's, there's something very special uh, that I've, I've always loved about your brand. And you and I have spoken about this. I'm a big, I'm a big nostalgia, vintage, historical nut. So like anything that kind of dives into the history of something really, really kind of like it, it gets to me, you know what I'm saying? So uh, having you on tonight is a, is a, is a real, real big pleasure. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. So, um, well, I'd like to, I'd like to kick it off because I'd like to dive into something that you and I are actually both pretty passionate about, but it's, it's not just cigars. We both obviously love cigars, but, uh, um, but we are going to talk a little bit about uh, the foundation that led to uh, 724. But before that, I do need to light up a cigar. But I, so I wanted to tell you the story. I told you I'd tell you the story online. So, uh, Bo Zaritsky, who set all of this up, your new guy there, who's back, got your back literally because he's right behind you, and he's got this all set up, squared up for us tonight and everything. Uh, sent me a few cigars. Oh, there he is, literally behind you. Uh, has uh, he's uh, <laughs> sent uh, some some awesome cigars for me, and also. This amazing 724 shirt that unfortunately is cut out of the frame and you have to look at my ugly face. I apologize. Um, but uh, today, uh, my wife and I were, uh, were thrown a party. Uh, they call it a sprinkle now because it's for your second child. But basically a baby shower for those people out there who aren't on the, the up and up. Uh, for our second born that's coming in a couple of months. And I selected a box of cigars to give out to folks today. And it wasn't just, it, it, it happened to be the fact that I was hosting you tonight, but I uh, handed out some of 724 Club Perfectos. Um, the reason I chose this cigar is um, because children are a 24 seven job. And, but just like your cigars, Kurt, um, it's the mo it's the small moments that we need to capture in our life so that we can always remember them always, uh, because those are the most memorable and everything. So that's where I was going with it. So I am, I'm excited to light one of these up tonight. 
and uh, and everything. But as I promised all of our viewers and promised you, I am really excited to talk about um, our mutual love for antiques, Tabacchiana. I mean, there, it, it runs deeper than all that, man. So like, tell me, you got started when you were a teenager, right? So like, when did, when did you get into antiques and everything? Well, I'd have to say when we were, first of all, I'm a twin. I have a twin brother named Kevin. And him and I started collecting uh, antiques uh, probably when we were about 15 or 16 years old. We started with like Coca-Cola memorabilia, uh, signs, and it just grew from there. Uh, it's, it's been, I hate to say, uh, almost 40 years now of collecting antiques. And eventually, uh, throughout the years and decades of collecting and hanging them in the house, hanging them in the garage, hanging them on the outside of the buildings, buying them, selling them. Uh, I opened up a, a retail store and through the uh, decoration process of uh, putting this my first retail store together I, I was able to like proudly showcase some of the antiques that I had collected and uh, at that point I started uh, turning it more towards the cigar end of it and uh, Antiques were hard to come by back then. Well, they were actually easier to come by, but harder to find specific items. As you know, uh, there was no internet then, and it was just basically driving around, uh, whether it was a yard sale, antique shop, estate sales, whatever, whatever you could find, any lead you could get, and just uh, go out and hit the pavement and... Uh, really start looking and uh, finding interesting, in, uh, you know, items. Uh, that's when I started getting into cigar memorabilia, collecting uh, whatever I could find. And I started, uh, uh, so we're, we're sitting in London, Derry, New Hampshire right now. And about 10 miles, or not even, about five miles from here is, is the original 724 Cigar Factory, which started in 1874. So I started seeing uh, a few items around New Hampshire that uh, said 724 and cigars on it. So as I uh, picked up a couple things, I started uh, also researching it and uh, discovered that, you know, a lot of really cool, interesting facts about the company. And uh, so I think my first item was uh, one of these green glass uh, ashtrays the Vaseline glass and uh hold, hold that a little closer to the camera Kurt so like this is this is what I'm talking about with glass like when I when I talk to people about antiques and stuff and they're like you know why do you you know it just looks old like why do you want everything and and also like to spell to dispel the the like the the theory that like antiquing is not cool and it's not masculine like because like when people think of antiquing they think of like old women going on like trips to like the middle of nowhere and everything but look at the stuff behind you look at that ashtray some of the coolest stuff in the world are antiques i mean we could call it we could call it tabacchiana we can call it classic cars we can call it whatever you want but they're antiques and they're awesome but that glass is really cool like that's something you don't you, you don't see anymore and you can always tell the age of it because of that greenish color and everything so is that is that your only ashtray is that the only one you've ever been able to find no <laughs> uh i have a ridiculously large collection of stuff. I probably have over the course of looking for these uh, 50 of them. And, oh, wow. Uh, several different variations. Uh, I do really have hundreds of pieces from this factory, and uh, they were really big into uh, marketing, and uh, it was all signage and uh, you know, tip trays. Here's a tip tray that you would have found on the at the local bar or restaurant where they would have delivered your change or your bill on stuff like that. And uh, it, it turned into a crazy passion. And uh, most of my waking hours that I'm not uh, working, I'm looking for antiques. I'm online now searching. There's a lot of uh, Facebook live auctions, uh, 
just uh, endless ways to find unique items. So constantly trying to upgrade the collection and uh, find more and more and find that one of a kind unique piece that uh, no one else has. So this is still a passion that drives you today. So like this started when you were a teenager and you're, I mean, you're still going like there's like this, this hasn't like, this hasn't phased out as, as you've gotten older or anything like that. It's still, it's still a part of who you are very much. So, the, the, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm uh, proud of this, but one of the first things I do every morning, I get on the computer and I start looking, see what people posted, see, uh, what's out there, see if I can find a unique item. And then we have a huge network of people that we communicate with constantly trying to, and, and they know what I collect. I know what they collect. So we, uh, you know, we network it all together. And, but that's really how this uh, brand came back to the market as I uh, collected antiques and I started learning and discovering the history of the brand. And uh, there was a lot of really cool and interesting, uh, you know, facts that I learned. And uh, one of them was, you know, it, it started in 1874. The original address of the factory was a, actually a small retail shop. And it was at 724 Elm Street, Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, right around the turn of the century, they built the factory that you guys might know or see on the, uh, on the boxes today. And, uh, it actually became the largest manufacturer of 10 cent cigars in the world through the thirties and forties. So even in today's standards, uh, they advertise how they, uh, had produced 80 million cigars a year in, uh, several of those decades. So as I start learning these facts and, uh, interesting things, I, I, you know, I'm in the retail cigar business. I thought it would be a good idea to call my lawyer and, see if we could uh, bring this brand back to life. So I was very fortunate there and I was able to obtain the trademark and uh, that's where the, the next portion of the history started. That's awesome. So 80 million cigars a year back in the heyday. So, so you, you picked up right where they left off and that's where you, that's what you guys produce each year now, right? Well, we're at about 70 million. <laughs> uh, uh, I can't even come close to that. We're probably one of the smaller manufacturers in the world, but uh, very proud of what we do. Absolutely. So, uh, so the name that we you see, if and that's that's always a good indicator. Um, obviously, I had uh, I had actually someone bring in a seven twenty four uh, vintage uh, sign. Um, actually, excuse me, a box top once uh, to me and asking me about its authenticity. And I was like, well, it's funny you have this. And I, I showed him, of course, your cigars that were on the shelf. I said, these still exist today. And they're like, oh man. So like, what's a good indicator if I'm looking at stuff, if um, there you go, exactly. What's a good indicator if uh, uh, of what's like older and what's not. I said, well, f first, and uh, you know, it was kind of tongue in cheek, but I said, the first thing I said, well, the first thing you got to look for, if it says K a Kendall 724, uh, it's not very old. Um, <laughs> And but if it has R.J. Sullivan's on it, it's uh, it's uh, it's definitely in the the antique sector. So that's like that's a good first indicator. Um, it's fun to see how uh, on eBay they're selling the uh, K.A. Kendall version of empty boxes online, and uh, it's, it is uh, it's comical, right? I'm sure because I've seen it too, and I'm sure when you see it, you kind of just kind of crack a smile. I'm sure and they just were famous for these Christmas boxes. So every year, you know, I can't say that they changed every year, but. It's a lot of unique packaging. This is actually a full box from 1950 that uh, still sealed. Oh, my sealed. gosh. Still sealed. So if you come to New Hampshire, I'm going to open them up. You and I are going to smoke these. Oh, my God. I got. Sorry. I'm going to stop the show because I want to go tell my wife that we're going to book a flight. <laughs> Oh man, that's that is that is a that is throwing the gauntlet down, Kurt. I'm I am so tempted to go up there now. You know, Bo did bring up, uh, Bo Zaritsky did bring up again, uh, a, during uh, my first chance to op opportunity to interview you, the, another, uh, another deal we made if I ever traveled up north to see you, which was uh, to actually drive one of your cars, your, your 1960 Ford truck, um, which like you have a great collection of cars and you mentioned your, that you said a couple of keepers that you had. Um, one of them, one of course is the vintage auto, uh, the 1930s Ford, right. That's in a lot of your advertising that you use. 
And then, of course, your 67 Shelby, which is probably most guys' dream. But you dropped, you were like, yeah, I have this really nice 1960 Shelby. And I was like, that's the one that I want to drive. So, and you'd said that uh, next time, if I ever get up there, you would, you would let me drive it. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to take, I'm going to take you up on both on those. I am. <laughs> you are in your mouth. Uh, lighten them up. That'll be fun. Absolutely. So kind of, kind of going back a little bit into, uh, before we get more into RG Sullivan's and the beginnings of 724 and how you came to own it as you kind of just led into, I want to talk a little bit about more about Tabacchiana. See, I, I do collect some pieces. I'm a big Granger pipe tobacco because they have a lot of baseball. They use a lot of baseball people in it. Uh, St. Louis Cardinals. I'm not a Cardinals fan necessarily, but there's a lot of baseball players using their advertisement. And then I've always liked these Niles and Moser. Nice. Uh, cigar tins i've got a i've got quite a few of them red and green um well christmas to most people are my favorite colors um so that's kind of why i've always liked them they always had good color they have uh this is not this one's not that old this one's a 10 cent tin they have five cent tins and everything but it's a it's a really cool really cool uh brand that was you know been around for quite a long time and apparently the trademark is actually still active apparently they're based out of denver now not sure what they're doing with it, but, uh, but, um, I've always, I've always liked those pieces. Uh, and I noticed you've got a, a Cinco cigar sign behind you as well as a couple of other 724 signs that 724 sign. That's, uh, the red one right behind you. What kind of, if you had to guess or what you've been told or from your own knowledge and it being a 10 cent sign, how, how old is that particular sign? Do you think? I think that sign is probably from the, uh, thirties, maybe through uh, the 40s. There were several variations of that red sign, and one of them underneath uh, the 724 logo said 10 cents right in the middle of the bottom. And throughout the years, I got several signs, and on the bottom where it said 10 cent was always scratched out. And uh, it finally dawned on me that as the price went up and they still had those signs kicking around, they had to knock that 10 cents off the sign because uh, they were probably went up to 12 cents. But yeah, the porcelain signs uh, in the U.S. were probably from the uh, late 20s uh, through, you know, even the 60s. But, uh, you know, I have several different variations of that sign, including blue ones and small ones and door pushes and a lot of cool stuff. Like you said, they were really like you said they were really big into marketing and everything. Those ashtrays that you had showed us earlier that you said you have about fifty of them. If you had to guess, like what's what's the average age or what's the oldest one you probably got? Like how old is it? You think? I think those uh, the green ashtrays probably go back that far as well. You know, maybe you know my guess would be forties uh, and uh, maybe later. I, I have several variations of them. A lot of them always have chips on them and right. Uh, with uh, white lettering on them, some with red. Some of them are actually embossed in uh, like a glass embossed, which is pretty rare, hard to come by. But uh, there, there's a lot of really nice items out there. And I know they're still out there in the wild. It's just a matter of finding them. So even when I go to Texas and I go see you guys, I, I make a uh, fish stop at the antique shops and uh, – I'm not sure he actually appreciates it. He, he pretends that he does, but it's, it's, uh, I can't help myself no matter where I am. I'm, I'm, my head's on a swivel looking around for stuff, looking for signs, still hanging on the buildings and you never know. Well, I can't eat too much. He's actually watching tonight. So, uh, saw him pop up on the chat and everything, but so he can't be, he can't be too upset by it. Otherwise he probably wouldn't be joining us tonight talking about this kind of stuff, but, uh, to kind of to go back to, uh, your, your acquisition of the brand and everything, you know, what was it about RG Sullivan in particular that really gravitated you towards it? Was it the marketing piece? Was it because of where it was from? Like what were a couple of the other reasons of that kind of really attracted you to the, to the brand and ultimately uh, to seeking out and acquiring the trademark? Well, as I uh, talked to a lot of people and uh, a lot of from historians to local Manchester uh, residents yeah, to actually a few family members of the Sullivan family. I recognized and I heard constantly about what a good guy he was and, uh, you know, a community leader. You know, people really looked up to him. And uh, 
I wasn't necessarily uh, wanting people to look up to me, but I I really uh, had a had this strong feeling about this guy and uh, what he did and uh, how many jobs he provided and the quality of cigars that he put out and uh, that really drove me to uh, that was that was part of the drive to bring the brand back. He was actually the largest taxpayer in the United States of America at one time, you know, and uh, that was uh, another rumor, probably not a rumor, but fact that I had heard a lot of really good stuff. I know he did a lot for the community and churches and uh, building things and playgrounds and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, obviously I've never met the guy. I've met some of his family, but, uh, you know, I, I, I respected that a lot. So that was part of the drive to uh, bring this brand back. I uh, I think it's uh, for me personally. I think it's 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 really fantastic that you last. And it could it could have been it literally could have been any brand from my perspective because I didn't have this connection to him or to the area that you know that like you did. But the reason that I I am so fascinated by by your story and the 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 story the brand of the story is that you have taken a part of you've taken a piece of history and given it new life in a way that is actually very much in the forefront of our brains because 724 let, let's face it Kurt it, it it's a drop in the bucket to the amount of cigar companies that were around during this time the 30s the 40s go back to the late 1800s when this was founded i mean it was literally a drop in the bucket when we talk about cigar brands in this country but here you are in 2019 um, obviously you started this company over 10 years ago, but like in 2009, you know, here we are in 2019 talking about 724 ta cigars, talking about RG Sullivan as you know, and bringing that history back to life. Were you motivated by that at all? Was that, was that part of your vision or is that just kind of a, a really great byproduct? Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a pretty good byproduct. Really. I had no idea where this was going to go to. And, uh, being a, uh, a retail tobacconist and bringing a brand back to the market was really just a uh, part of the entrepreneurial craziness that goes through my head. So, you know, my drive and uh, passion came from uh, whether or not I could actually pull it off and put it together. It wasn't to, you know, bring it back to the largest cigar manufacturer in the world, but I, I wanted to bring quality and history and, you know, good, you know, square business back. And uh, that's still my goal today. You know, every day we uh, strive for that. The I hear Eric Newman uh, recently say, and he was commenting about his, uh, his cigar company and how it's the uh, longest uh, continually run factory in the United States. And he had made a comment that there was about 42,000 cigar, small cigar factories in the United States of America. So that, that blew me away when I heard that. I knew there was a lot, but had no idea there was that many. I mean, even in my hometown, see, I grew up in El Paso, Texas, Kurt, and even in my hometown, there was, uh, there was a really large cigar factory that employed uh, about a thousand people back at around the turn of the century in the 1900s and everything. Uh, of course that completely went by the wayside. It doesn't exist anymore, but I mean, that's, that's how ingrained this. I mean, I mean, and I could tell you El Paso, Texas is not a great tobacco growing climate. So we know it's not like it was indigenous to that part of the country. I mean, these were people that were, at, this was a factory that was actively bringing to cigar tobacco in. And, you know, now that, you know, that company's that, that company, the building, everything is completely gone. And it actually was a great piece done, done in my local pay, the local paper, not too long ago that I, I actually learned about it for the first time as a 30 something year old. And so, you know, they were all over the country and, and now we get to have a piece of it back by having 724 cigars, uh, back to the market. So it's, it's really good that it's, I think it's, I think it's important. It's an important story to tell because it's not just, um, you know, it's not just, it's not just, uh, from the business aspect, everything it, it's important for, for people that oppose the cigar industry to understand the context of, you know, what this industry has, has brought to this country and, and, and continues to do today. 
Uh, and I think that 724 cigars is a, is a great example of that. Um, so, Mayor, now you got to go out and find a piece of uh, history from that brand. See if you can find a piece of memorabilia. Now I'll be looking. I've been trying, man. I, I've been trying. I'll I'll send you the article when I when I uh, if I when I think about it to uh, to get it out to you. And my mom, my mom's still very much old school. She uh, she sent it to me actually, and of course she she clipped it out. Um, you know, this is because she she doesn't know how to find stuff online, so she clipped it out and sent it to me. But it's a really really cool piece, uh, and I'll I'll send it to you when I when I uh, I'll actually dig it up with the link and I'll send you the link to it, but it's, it's really cool. The story was really well done. The piece was really well done. And it was really cool to kind of see from my own personal history that there was something to kind of tie me back into it as well and everything. Um, so Kurt really dive in again, we talk about 2019, talk about 2019. We just had uh, our industry's trade show uh, last month where you guys are actually bringing back the 1874, uh, a cigar uh, back to market and everything. Tell me a little bit about that project and why that was uh, something that you were uh, really excited to, to bring to bring back as well. Well, 1874 was our only uh, Nicaraguan made cigar. And uh, I really like the blend. I like the everything about that cigar. And the goal was to bring back a, bring it, bring a Nicaraguan cigar to the market that wasn't just like everyone else's. So I think we did a pretty good job at that, but we used it uh, as a limited edition. And we used it, uh, you know, for the shops that uh, supported our brand. And we used it for uh, special occasions and uh, events. And this year we decided to put it into full production. We did give it a little bit of a facelift. We have new packaging on that. And uh, it's actually due out at the end of next month, uh, hopefully, if everything comes together right. But even the packaging on our cigars, you know, we, we did our best to try and duplicate a lot of the packaging for today's market. And uh, that box I showed you earlier, you know, we used that script writing on the uh, 1874 to just use this piece of history that's sitting in my hand I, I couldn't help myself everything we've done with the brand as far as marketing and names for series you know all have a meaning behind the brand and uh but that should be out we also introduced a couple new sizes in that and i'm excited to bring it to a uh, full production and uh, the market uh, in the next month or so you know, we talked a lot about 724's marketability because of the marketing that they did. And, and they were, as you mentioned, their, their logo was everywhere. It's plastered everywhere. And you've done a really great job of bringing that back to life. When you brought back that classic script logo, were you, were you worried at all that, you know, that it may, that it may, you know, because people have kind of grown used to the actual, you know, 724 logo um, and seeing it differently? Or did you think that that was, that was a way to kind of, kind of give it real life, you know, put some life back into it add some pop to it yeah well i thought it was a great idea and i loved it and i liked looking at it and uh it's pleasing uh that particular font is a little bit hard to read and not cursive man it's just the doom to everybody <laughs> not everybody uh really uh dug the the way we did that and uh you know not everybody loved it as much as me so Actually, with this new packaging, we've eliminated that cursive writing, and uh, we, we came up with a new design for the box. And, uh, you know, as much as I really didn't want to, I, I realized that we needed to. Because it does look completely different than uh, the other packaging with the factory and the, our, the, our traditional logo. It'll, I am excited to kind of see that final product of it. But I, I really like the script, too. I just thought it was, I just thought it was interesting. Um, because, and even, and even to RG Sullivan, cause I mean, that was, that was a different way of laying it out. He's the one who built this brand and this logo originally, and he, he plastered it everywhere. And then he had something different as well with that particular box too. So it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's interesting how, um, you know, how sometimes, you know, even very simple classic things like that can let add real you know, new life to, to certain products and everything. So I'm excited to see what the, what the new, uh, the new label and box on the uh, 1874s will be like and everything. So that's, that's coming. You said, hopefully if everything comes to work, it should be uh, hitting retailer shelves next month. Yes. 
end of next month. But that oh. that uh that cursive uh font was done prior to that factory they built. So the the cursive font was uh before the building itself. So the Uh, I don't have the box in front of me, but I had a box where it says the new 724 factory on the inside label up here. Oh, and wow. That was uh, just after uh, they stopped using the font. So uh, it was uh, probably the first, uh, you know, uh, logo for the company, but it didn't last uh, up through the years to come. So the last couple of things I want to dive into you with Kurt before I go into our curveball segment for that. Again, Kurt, thank you so much for your time this evening. This has been fantastic. So, you know, I mean, from the very onset of when the first uh, time I saw it, and I'm pretty, you know, I don't want to speak for everyone out there, but I think for when most people see 724, they probably have, they probably have the, the same inclination as I did that everyone, uh, that it has something to do with, you know, time. But as you indicated just a few minutes ago, it actually has a very less symbolic meeting, and it's it's actually more practical. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, so, there, was, uh, there was a rumor that uh, that I had read over the years that it, it was uh, winning lottery numbers that uh, Roger Sullivan had uh, used. But really, to come to find out through uh, different research and uh, printed items, you know, they, they started uh, – a small retail factory where they uh, published, they made 21,000 cigars their first year. And it was at 724 Elm street, Manchester, New Hampshire. That's awesome. And, but I think that kind of goes to show that at the time when cigars were so wildly manufactured and there were so many, you know, picking a unique name, even in today, I mean, even in today's market is difficult, but even back then, you know, it was probably even more so. And they had to be, they had to try to do something unique or if they ever went into the next town or the next County or God forbid the next state, they could probably run into another Jones cigar company or Smith's cigar company. So they had to come up with something unique and an address on, uh, you know, certainly, uh, it's certainly one of those things for sure. <laughs> well, um, ripoffs over the years too. And uh, not in today's market, but as I've uh, looked and collected this stuff, we recently saw 723 cigar packaging and we saw, I have one uh, I just posted recently that was, I believe, 7-60 and it had a picture of the factory on it. So, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of counterfeits even back in the day, man. That's crazy. That is unbelievable. I guess, I mean, yeah, with... I mean, you know, as fact as rampant as fact checking is in today's in today's society. I mean, back then you just you couldn't go to you couldn't go to Google or or even your own phone book, you know, you know, to to check for things. So that's 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 really interesting. The uh, the the last thing I wanted to touch on here before we went into our curveball segment was to to kind of revisit the subject about cars because I mean, cars are something that you're you're passionate about. All antiques. Um, are you still doing Coca-Cola or did that kind of fall off uh, from your teen years? Uh, no, occasionally I have a few Coca-Cola signs. I have two Coca-Cola machines in my living room. Uh, I recently just bought three uh, Coca-Cola thermometers from a friend up in Maine. And uh, I just got those a couple of days ago. It's still exciting to find that stuff. And uh, I, you know, the, the classic Coca-Cola logo and, uh, is you know that's america you know so it's uh you know i have a giant coca-cola sign in my living room and uh i got it all over the place so you know fortunate with uh where i work where i live in my garage i'm surrounded by uh i mean i'm looking at a coca-cola sign above our bar here at the 724 lounge so it's uh i love it all that's that's awesome. That's awesome that like one of the very first antiques that you started collecting. It's still you know it's still a prominent part of your collection and everything. So to to dive back into to dive back into your your car collection and everything. We we talked about some of your keepers that you have, which is sixty seven Shelby, nineteen sixty four pickup, and a nineteen thirties Ford that's figured very prominently in a lot of your advertisements. Did you pick the uh, Did you pick the Ford uh, 
the, the 30s Ford because it was symbolic of the time of when 724 was prominent? Or does that car have special meaning for you? I know it's one of your keepers, so I know it's very special to you. But Well, no, I didn't pick it. It had nothing to do with that, really. Uh, you know, I bought and sold, you know, I could probably say hundreds of cars, most of them classic cars. And throughout the years, you kind of build your way up to finding a keeper. I started liking Fords, uh, where most people like uh, GM products and Chevrolet. Uh, I found Fords, uh, like the mentor that taught me how to be a mechanic, loved Ford. So, you know, we'd find an old Ford in the field, and the distributor was always in the front. And uh, generally, a guy would park the car in the field. You could uh, bring it out of the field, put some new points in it, and uh, get it running in no time. But so I started just uh, keeping a few old Fords and uh, that 39 Ford Coupe that I have, just that classic, uh, you know, five window Coupe. And uh, I love the look of it. And uh, that's, that's the reason why I have that car. And I've had it for a lot of years. Uh, you know, we built it right in my garage. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Is there any, are there any cars that you're working on right now that you're with, have the i guess the potential to be a keeper or something that or just something that you're really excited about not right now you know i, I actually uh entertained buying a 68 cadillac the other day uh and it's still in my mind and uh probably keep me up tonight but uh i'm working on uh, no cars right now i'm basically maintaining the ones i have uh i was fortunate enough yesterday to uh drive my old Shelby to a local farm stand and pick up some produce. And uh, the thrill of that, you know, through a country road in New Hampshire is, uh, there's nothing like it. That's awesome. So I, do you, do you think that uh, any of your car collections or your, the, your love for cars will ever seep into any future 724 cigars projects? Yeah, it's a good possibility. You know, I try to be uh, true to myself and what I do and who I am. So we've used a few of them in the ads in the past. And, uh, you know, I always wanted to hit the road uh, with one of my cars and, you know, travel the country and do something like that. But realistically, you know, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, you know, as these old beaters, uh, they don't go up and down the highways that well, you know, but maybe someday I'll go out and uh, hit the road. And unfortunately I'll probably have a trailer behind me, but I'll park it at the local Walmart and uh, drive the car around to the, the shops. To the shops. There you go. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine driving around. Um, man, I, I'm, I'm in my studio here in Euless, Texas, which happens to be my garage. And I think it topped out at, we had a cool front come in today and it was about 93 degrees with about 80% humidity. Uh, and I'm in my garage right now, so it's comfort is not something uh, I don't have any AC, so I can't imagine driving around in one of those vintage automobiles in the middle of summer, especially here in Texas. That would probably be, uh, um, but on the, you know, on the bright side, I would be a lot thinner at the end of that trip. So, <laughs> so Kurt, again, thank you so much for your time tonight. The, the last question I have as we go into our curveball segment is something that, um, uh, that I, I, I profess I haven't really nerded out very much about this particular subject with antiques with anyone. So it's, it's really great to talk to someone about it because I, I just find the whole world very fascinating. I'm, I'm in love with very old things, vintage things, much like yourself. Uh, and I love that each individual piece, you know, is it, tried and cliche as it sounds, it tells a story. And, and so like, uh, so talking to you about this stuff has been really, really fantastic for me. But one of the, sh there's a TV show that I have absolutely loved since the inception of it. I still watch it today. Um, and I just, I geek out, especially the very rare, they don't do it. They don't, it doesn't talk on it. doesn't pop up much on it, but when it does, it really kind of gets me going. And that of course, that show of course is American pickers, which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with. I'm not sure if you're a fan or not, which leads me to my question. If you were approached to be on the American Pickers television show, um, would you take them up on that opportunity or would you decline and why? Either way. Well, you know, I, 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 I've watched all those shows. I've probably seen every episode. I uh, have them all recorded at my house. So okay, so you are a fan. I was really worried because I figured, man, he's going to think I'm the biggest dweeb and this is 
Total. Okay. Fantastic. Keep going. <laughs> oh, so as I watch that show and I see what they do and the techniques they use, the things they say, you know, are all things that uh, have come through or out of me over the years past. So when that show first came out, you know, I was completely addicted. Couldn't wait for the next episode. And uh, I, I still love watching it today. Uh, one of the things, uh, you know, it has brought a lot of light to what I collect. So it's actually, it's kind of like Cigar Aficionado, the light that that brought to the cigar world and uh, the popularity. So with that show, it's brought a lot of light to the sign collecting. And uh, there's a lot more competition out there right now. But to answer your question, you know, I would be honored to be a part of that show. You know, I don't think I, I don't really qualify for that show, but, you know, I'd love to be part of it. I'd like to just watch them film it or, you know, meet the guys. I have bought a few items from uh, Robbie Wolf on uh, online because there's a big online presence of uh, – purchasing going on but you know absolutely i'd take that opportunity in a minute and uh love to be part of it so robbie of course is is mike the problem the, and robbie's made several appearances on the show much more lately in the last few seasons and everything but of course he's mike wolf's brother uh the, the one of the main of the two main guys on the show and everything so that's that's cool that you have the connection but i heard i heard a rumor that there was actually uh, a much closer connection to the show that you had knew someone that actually almost had the opportunity to be on it is that true well, it is true, uh, and it's probably not as glamorous as you might think, but they, they were filming in Connecticut at my twin brother's friend's house, and he called me and said he had the opportunity as they called and ordered lunch. Now, my brother's in the restaurant business, so he had an opportunity to uh, you know, dazzle them with some of his spectacular food and deliver it on set, and... Uh, that's the closest connection I've ever had to it, uh, other than, you know, people I know that know him. But, yeah, my twin brother did go there. He said it was all business on set, and, uh, but he enjoyed meeting the guys. So is your, brother, is your brother still into antiques as much as you, or is he kind of – Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so, that, oh, so that was a thrill. Oh, yeah. He's, he's into it as much or more than I am. Uh, we've always been a little competitive in it, but now as we get older, you know, we we do share a lot, you know, we, we still get very excited when we find something. And the first thing I do when I find something cool is I send a picture to my brother and, uh, you know, kind of show off a little bit. And then, you know, we've also bought and sold stuff from each other, uh, over and over hundreds of times. So he's also in the cars. He's my twin brother and probably my best friend on earth. And, uh, and he loves cigars. Awesome. So you guys have really stayed connected over years. That's, that's fantastic. I, I think something like this can actually really bring people close together. And it, it's, it's really interesting. It's, it's just, it's just really, really fascinating to me. And it's, I think it's really cool that, and I saw this actually, I saw this actually at the show. I, I, I saw someone who honestly, it, it was a retailer that was visiting your booth. And I actually, I, I actually kind of cornered him afterwards and I said, hey, you know, because he was talking, you were talking to him about some of some a little bit of the, the history, kind of what we were talking about. And you were kind of going a little bit into your uh, talking about some antique stuff. Some of the some of the pieces that you some of the um, the pieces that you're kind of using as kind of a swag because you don't have traditional swag necessarily. You have a couple of vintage pieces that have been refabricated or reproduced and everything that you've kind of brought back and you were kind of talking about it. And, this guy was sitting there listening to it. I was like, Hey, what did you think about that? Not really like accusing him of being bored or anything like that. I just kind of wanted to see, get his thoughts. He's like, he's like, man, that's you. That's not really my thing, but that is just so, he was like, that is so awesome. Like he was really excited about it. And I was like, Oh, do you collect anything like that? And he's like, Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> but, but it, it, it had a way of still bringing people in. So I think that like, even if you're not in, to it as much as you or I or your brother or the people that you, the community that you're involved with and stuff I think it has a really great way of bringing in the cigar you know tapping into the cigar community uh, you know kind of that nostalgia feel about it more so than tobacco already does so I think that's what's really fantastic about it because that was proof in the pudding that that truly happened so um I would love to see you on on American Pickers Kirk because I would love to see Tobacchiana get a real nice feature done on it 
Um, I'm still looking for, I'll tell you what, my, one of the pieces, I've seen it several times. They're out there. It's not like something super rare, but I've just loved the sign. And I just, the, the signs that I see are just, uh, I just, I can't, I can't justify paying for it. But the Dolly Madison Cigar Company, I'm sure you've seen several dozen, if not hundred pieces. Like I said, they're not super rare. They're usually in pretty good condition. I'm usually, I'm probably going to just have to, you know, buy a really, find a really bad beat up one. And because that's probably all I can afford as you, as you've mentioned, the sign competition and, and prices have gotten pretty, uh, pretty up there since, uh, since it's become a little bit more prominent. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, I'll keep my eyes open. I'm pretty awesome. confident in your, in your future. You'll have one of those on the wall. It's always good to have an ally anywhere you can. But Kurt, again, I can't thank you enough for joining me tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope everyone enjoyed um, this, as uh, as cheesy as it sounds, this trip down memory lane as much as I did, kind of talking about the history of 724 and what the roots of your company uh, meant back when cigars were such a fully, fully ingrained part of our country's lifeline and it's just uh it's just been a real pleasure so thank you well bear you thank me several times for being on the show and uh i want to thank you because i really appreciate you uh and what you do and uh being able to share this with you and the, the people watching so thank you very much i really appreciate it I was honored sir thank you so much and for everyone out there I really appreciate you guys tuning in make sure that if you are uh listening to us via podcast wherever podcasts are play apple podcast spotify google play podbean wherever make sure you download subscribe leave a review because that's what it's all about and that keeps us telling us what you guys are interested in. and if you want to know more about kurt's story or any of our other amazing guests that's the place to do it so check us out make sure you download subscribe leave a review and remember that you're listening to us because exclusively because of cornelius and anthony premium cigars and you're watching us tonight because of our other sponsor drew estate can't thank you guys enough but mostly all the thanks goes to my wonderful guest kurt and all the wonderful guests that i had this was our 87th take 87 nice. this is crazy that is crazy congratulations on that thank you so much and we're we're creeping up on 100 and we're pro, you know i can't believe that it's uh it's been almost 2 years and i'm 87 in and i've gotten to talk to such incredible people like you like you Kurt it's been it's been incredible so uh everyone i bid you an absolute wonderful evening hope everyone has a great week come back next week we got another special episode um it is going to be absolutely fantastic and I just, I'm super excited about this particular show because it's going to be a little bit of a special show um, that is a little bit different than what we normally do here on Ellis from our takes. We're going to pay tribute to a film. It is the 30th anniversary of Field of Dreams, and my guest will be Crown Heads Miguel Shodell. And we'll be talking about Field of Dreams, baseball, and of course, cigars. Uh, because that's what we're all about, and it'll be a fantastic show. So tune in next Sunday as we dive in, into the 30th anniversary of my favorite baseball film, uh, Field of Dreams. So from this trip down memory lane to another trip down memory lane, that's what we're doing on these next couple weeks with L.O.S. Fumar Takes. For everyone out there, we really appreciate all your likes, shares, and comments. As always, I'm Bear Duplissy. He's Kurt Kendall. We'll see you next time.